All right, well, welcome to Landmark Chambers webinar dealing with planning High Court challenges. This is session two. We're delighted to see uh, so many of you joining us uh, in the session today, and we we'll hope you'll find the presentations and the discussion both useful and informative. This is the second of a three-part webinar series. Uh, the recordings and the presentation for the first session are available on the resources page of our website. Uh, and the third and final session is taking place in a week on Monday, the 28th of November. My name is Matthew Reed. I'll be chairing the session today and I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Alex Goodman, Heather Sargent, Nick Grant and Harley Ronan. Uh, firstly, Alex Goodman, who will be dealing with the Public Sector Equality Duty Challenges Case Law Update section uh, of the webinar. Uh, Alex, his work uh, often involves the interaction uh, of planning with other fields of law. He recently acted for the successful claimant in Howe against Secretary of State for the Home Department, uh, which related to a planning permission that was granted for a, an asylum accommodation centre. It's found to be unlawful for breach of the requirement to undertake an equality impact assessment. Uh, it, last week, he was in the Court of Appeal uh, in a case uh, dealing with cumulative impacts under the habitat regulations uh, relating to the pollution of the River Wye, in the case of Sohota and Herefordshire. Uh, and that follows a range of work that he's dealt with in uh, regard to the pollution uh, issues arising in respect of agriculture. Uh, and uh, can be, he can be seen um, in the cases both of Norman and Gardner. Uh, and he'll shortly be arguing uh, a case uh, before the Supreme Court in the uh, case of Day against Shropshire, which is a challenge to a grant of planning permission for housing development. Turning next to Heather Sargent, uh, she'll be dealing with heritage case law and the update, uh, updated position with regard to that. Heather's ranked uh, as the fourth highest rated junior planning barrister in the planning law survey 2022, and she's been listed as one of the top five juniors by that survey for the past three years. Her current projects include acting for Marks and Spencer on appeal in relation to its new flagship store at Marble Arch, advising the promoter of the Euston Nova Station development and advising Gatwick Airport on its Northern Runway project. Uh, Nick Grant uh, will be uh, de uh, dealing with recent development plan challenges. He joined Chambers in 2019 as a specialist planning and environment practitioner He's on the Attorney General C panel. He's ranked as a rising star in uh, the Legal 500 planning section and was, was uh, identified as one of the top planning barristers under 35 in the planning magazine. His cases include the uh, dealing with the world's first tidal stream development zone in Anglesey, the Seneca Solar Farm DCO, uh, a case uh, known by many, that's to say AHGR and Kane Laverack, he was part of the uh, government's Supreme Court team in Finch, and he's represented the UK before the UN's Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee. Turning finally to Harley Ronan, he'll be dealing with the latest NPPF cases. He joined Chambers in October of this year, and he's developing a practice encompassing all aspects of planning and environmental law. His recent planning work includes appearing in inquiries and in planning enforcement cases, advising on potential challenges to planning decisions and other aspects of planning law, particularly in relation to uh, where uh, environmental issues arise. Prior to joining Chambers, he completed a doctorate in law, which focused on alternative housing models and worked at the Law Commission on leasehold and common hold reform. Those are our four speakers, and uh, we'll be dealing first with those matters uh, arising from the MPPF cases, uh, and Harley Ronan will uh, be delivering that part of the webinar. Over to you, Harley. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Matt said, I've been tasked with um, giving you an update on the latest MPPF cases. And as you'll know, the MPPF was 10 years old um, this year, but despite that, my case update um, very much covers um, some familiar ground. So the topics I'll be covering our um, five-year housing land supply, paragraph 11G, and how to determine which policies uh, are most important for the purposes of the tilted balance, the meaning of design in paragraph 120. Uh, I've got a quick update on some of the latest Greenbelt cases, and there's also an interesting case, a few interesting cases actually, on paragraph 99, 
uh, and the loss of recreational facilities. So it'll be a bit of a blitz, there's quite a lot to get through, um, but there's some detailed uh, detailed extracts on, on my slides, which um, you can you can make reference to if, if I don't cover everything in, in enough detail. So starting with five year housing land supply, and I think probably the most the most important High Court um, housing land supply case of this year, which is Tewkesbury and Secretary of State for Housing Communities and Local Government. Um, this case concerned whether when a local authority is calculating its housing land supply, the previous oversupply of housing in the previous monitoring years can be taken into account when you're determining your current five-year housing land supply. Now that mattered in this case because Tewkesbury had an adopted local plan which contained an annual housing requirement, which had an, a housing requirement which it used to calculate its annual requirement. And to date, Tewkesbury had been delivering more houses than it than it needed to under that requirement for nine years it never dipped below uh, what it needed to provide um but at appeal in this case the developer argued that the local authority could only demonstrate 2.4 years of housing land supply um and Tewkesbury responded by saying that those previous nine years of oversupply should be taken into account and effectively credited against the next five years so in substance the requirement for the next five years would be reduced if that credit was taken into account. And the council argued that under the MPPF, um, this, this oversupply had to be taken into account, that the purpose of the requirement was to ensure that housing was being delivered across the whole plan period, and that the MPPF must therefore be interpreted to take that oversupply into account. Now, the court Mr Justice Dove was uh, unimpressed with that um, argument and he concluded that there is no obligation in the MPPF to take into account previous oversupply and in particular he held that the framework is silent or, or doesn't deal with the situation where oversupply has occurred um, when you're calculating your current five-year supply uh, and in the absence of, of that silence and this really I think at, at paragraph 43 is a more general proposition in the absence of a of the framework dealing with a, with a particular point, it's not the task of the court to step and step in and fill in that gap by by devising a policy. And it's not uncommon for there to be gaps in the MPPF, um, as Mr. Justice does, says there. So it doesn't have to be taken into account. But critically, Mr. Justice has said that there's no barrier to it being taken into account in any particular case. So he held that when it arises that there is no policy covering a particular situation. It is generally a matter of planning judgment and in the context of housing land supply the question of whether to take previous supply into account will always be a matter of um, judgment for the decision maker in the particular circumstances of the case uh, and in particular he, he rejected the suggestion that it will always be a binary choice between taking it into account or not taking into account he said rather that there are several broad policy approaches approaches that could be taken so where does that leave us? Well, for many of you, I suspect this, this probably won't be a problem because many of you will probably be involved with local authorities that, that have not been demonstrating a housing land supply for some years. Um, but I, I understand that actually this is actually having an effect already. I, I've recently been involved in an inquiry where oversupply has been put in issue and we are an, an argument has arisen, arisen in respect to that point. Um, there are at least two appeal decisions that I'm aware of where inspectors um, have dealt with this question and accepted that previous supply can potentially be taken into account. I'm not going to go into the detail, but the, the appeal decisions there um, are there if, 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 you, if you need further information. So that's, that's uh, five-year housing land supply. Moving on to the related point of paragraph 11D and determining when the most important policies for an application are out of date, such that the tilted balance is engaged. Um, the important case this year was uh, Gosea Limited and Eastleigh Borough Council. In this case concerned conditional planning commission for the extension of a runway at Southampton International Airport. Now, in this case, the claimant argued that the officers had misinterpreted paragraph 11D because they hadn't made an explicit assessment of what policies were the most important 
for the ter determining the application, and specifically that the policy in question, 11, sorry, 115E, the officers didn't say in explicit terms that this is the most important policy. Rather, the, the officer's report dealt with it in these terms, it's on the slide. Um, the officer noted that 115E lacks flexibility and is out of step with the MPPF and is therefore deemed out of date. Now, claimant said this was wrong. You have to explicitly say which is the most important policy. Um, and this was roundly rejected by Mr. Justice Holgate. Uh, he considered that it was obvious that the officer found that 115E was the most important policy and it was obvious that he found it was out of date. Um, and in particular, at paragraph 167, Mr. Justice Holgate notes that there was no need for that to be spelt out in order to satisfy the legal requirement. And in particular, uh, it's quite critical of the claimant, the last sentence of, of 167, judicial review is not concerned with awarding marks for the draftmanship of an officer's report. Um, again, to him, it was obvious that uh, he had decided which policy was the most important, and he was highly critical of the claimant for uh, engaging in a minute legal analysis of the officer's report um, and noted that the important message in, in Mansell is still not being heeded. I'll just note actually just another slide there. This was this wasn't the, the particular point in issue, but it's just 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 note Mr. Justice Holgate's decision there at 159 that um, just re-emphasizing that that importance um, for the purposes of paragraph 11D is a matter of judgment for the decision maker and it's not a legal rule or principle. Uh, it's a practical policy tool to be used in, in decision making. Uh, moving on then from, from housing land supply and uh, paragraph 11D to paragraph 120E of the MPPF. Um, and this concerned um, how decision makers should, should support proposals which propose to develop airspace. And many of you will know that 120E says that decision makers should support opportunities to use airspace above development, um, in particular where it is well designed. Now, the, case, uh, the issue in this case was, what does that mean? What does it mean to say that a, a, a proposal is, is well designed? Um, the officer's report said that the proposed addition would be um, in keeping with the existing context of surrounding building heights and would not interrupt the skyline. Uh, claimant took issue with that and said that that was a wrong interpretation of 120E uh, because in particular, well-designed doesn't just mean the appearance of the development, um, but also the, the structural integrity of the design. So the structural design must be taken into account when determining whether the proposal is well-designed and that the MPPF uh, as a whole doesn't distinguish between um, appearance and structure when it uses the word design. Uh, that was rejected by, by the High Court. Um, the uh, judge noted that the design, design occupies a, a, a distinct chapter in the MPPF and there's no reference to structural integrity within that chapter. Uh, it's therefore a, a distinct term for stru from structural design and that latter term is left to building control. Uh, and if it were to refer to structural integrity, you would essentially start seeing questions of building control being brought into matters of planning uh, and that overall the, the court considered was an unrealistic approach to the interpretation of the MPPF. Um, finally, well, not, not quite finally, but um, the latest Greenbelt cases, there's three in particular that I want to draw your attention to. The first is Warwick District Council and Secretary of State for levelling up and levelling up housing and communities. This concerned paragraph 149 and the exception in the MPPF uh, to inappropriate development. Uh, and one of the exceptions, i.e. development will not be inappropriate development if the development is an extension or an alteration of a building which does not result in disproportionate additions over and above the size of the additional building. And the question that fell to be determined in this case was whether if the extension you're relying on which you, which you say is, is not inappropriate development, does it have to be physically attached to the building for the purposes of paragraph 149? 
and the key key quest, key requirement was was no um it has to be the protection was against disproportionate additions not that the extension was attached to the existing building so it's perfectly permissible following this judgment for a proposed development which is an outbuilding for example an entirely detached structure from the existing building to constitute an extension to the existing building for the purposes of paragraph 149. Two other cases on Greenbelt, I'm not going to go into them in any detail, but the first is Whitley, Whitley Parish Council in North Yorkshire. Um, that concerned a, uh, a proposal um, for the extraction of pulverized fuel ash from a former disposal site within the Greenbelt. It was quite a large proposed development um, and the claimant contended that in considering whether the, the proposal was inappropriate development, that the LPA had effectively split up the proposal into lots of different sections and considered on a case-by-case -case basis which was appropriate and which was inappropriate. Now, the court rejected that that was the LPA's approach, but interestingly, you, there's a, an endorsement of the Chemnall Manor principle where which provides that um, when determining whether development is, is appropriate or not for the purposes of the green belt, you must look at it as a whole and not by reference to any particular part. And the other case I've just referenced there is Sefton and Secretary of State. Uh, it actually came out at the end of last year in December, but I've included it in this year. Um, it, almost, it almost made the cut. Um, and that's about paragraph 148 and how you assess harm of um, development in the green belt. And the claimant in that case suggested that you essentially have to uh, account for harm and benefit uh, almost as a profit and loss kind of exercise as a mathematical equation where each is set off against the other uh, and that was roundly rejected um, by the court uh, it's an exercise of planning judgment it's a single exercise of judgment in particular uh, and the decision maker must consider whether there are special circumstances which justify the grant of permission uh, the final few cases on the MPPF that I want to draw your attention to in our update are TV Harrison um, Community Interest Company and Leeds City Council. That's actually one of two cases that um, my colleague in Chambers, Jenny Wigley Casey, uh, has been doing. Um, and it concerns a, a sport field and a, a decision to, to approve development on this, on this sports field or this open space. Um, and this case concerned, this, one of these two cases concerned uh, paragraph 99 of the MPPF um, and paragraph 99 um, in summary says that where existing open spaces, sports and recreational buildings and land um, are proposed to be developed upon, they should not be built on unless an assessment has been undertaken, which has clearly shown that the open space buildings or land are surplus to requirements. Um, and TV Harrison reiterates that whether a facility is surplus to requirements as a matter of planning judgment uh, and in the absence of any irras irrationality or misleading statements it's perfectly open to to the LPA in that case to conclude that the open space was of such poor quality that it added nothing to local needs and therefore was surplus to requirements um, and the other case on, on paragraph 99 is Millwood Designer Homes uh, and Secretary of State for Communities Housing and Local Government again that came up towards the end of last year um, and that emphasizes that when you are determining whether uh, a, a proposal on, a, on an open space, that open space, whether it's surplus to requirements, you have to apply that, that requirement with, with good sense and realism. And that case um, involved a riding school whereby the buildings were, were no longer being used, but various parts of the land <clears throat> which formed part of the school were still being used. And the LPA, um, I think, considered that uh, the, it was not um, surplus to requirements as, as it was parts of it were still in use. Um, High Court held that that was, was, was a good and sensible decision uh, and in accordance with paragraph 99 of the MPPF. Um, that's it for uh, MPPF updates then. I'm going to hand over to, to Heather, who is going to take you through the latest cases on heritage. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks very much for that very helpful update, Harley. I am, as Harley said, going to do the heritage case law update, and I'm going to start with bad news for those of you who are particularly interested in heritage because it hasn't been a particularly groundbreaking year in terms of court analysis. 
There have been a number of cases that have considered the 2021 decision of the Court of Appeal in Bramshill, so I want to look at those first, and then if there's time, there has also been a sequel to the 2021 decision of Mrs Justice Lang in Kinsey, um, so we'll look at that at the end. And starting with the cases that have considered Brands Hill, the first one is Wiltshire Council against the Secretary of State, um, a decision from January this year, which as you can see from the slide was a section 288 challenge to a decision to grant planning permission on appeal for 10 affordable housing units. Ground two of that was an allegation that there had been a misinterpretation of a core policy strategy. And um, the core policy strategy in question was one that seeks to ensure conservation of the historic environment. Now, the inspector found that the scheme would conflict with the, with the, uh, the policy, but reduced the weight to be given to the harm um, derived from that um, down from great to moderate because the policy didn't include provision for balancing um, potential benefits of the scheme against the heritage harm. Now, for any of you who are very familiar with the Court of Appeal decision in Bramshill, this might start to sound familiar. Um, now, in Bramshill, the inspector had given significant weight to local plan policies, even though it had been agreed at the inquiry that they were inconsistent with MPPF policy on heritage assets because they didn't provide for public benefits to be balanced against the harm. Um, but Sir Keith Lindblom held that the absence of an explicit reference to striking a balance between heritage harm and public benefits didn't put the local plan policies into conflict with the MPPF or with the statutory duty in section 66 of the 1990 Act. Um, so in short, in Bramshill, the inspector was found not to have misinterpreted local plan policy. Um, because even though it didn't contain any explicit reference to balancing heritage harm against public benefits, the inspector in Bramshill had correctly interpreted the local plan policy as not barring um, that balancing exercise. What happens then in, Wilch in Wiltshire is that the claimant accepts that the inspector did carry out a balancing exercise, but the argument was that because the balancing exercise had been done under the MPPF and not by applying the local plan policy, um, there was an unlawfulness in, in the approach of the inspector. The High Court rejected that argument and held that the inspector had carried out a similar exercise to the one that had been undertaken in Bramshill and noted that the inspector had also given considerable weight to the statutory duty under section 66. So this ground of the challenge in relation to heritage was rejected. In terms of what um, I think we can take from Wiltshire and what it says about Bramshill, where a local plan heritage policy does not explicitly require heritage harm to be balanced against benefits, then the decision maker must, I think, be careful not to interpret that policy as shutting out the balancing exercise. I think a local plan policy that did prepare to shut out the balancing exercise would be inconsistent with the MPPF, um, but that's not what the local plan policies in Bramshill and Wiltshire actually did. So where you've got a local plan heritage policy that doesn't make explicit provision for the balancing exercise, but doesn't prepare to preclude it either, then I think one shouldn't really get too excited about the absence of an explicit balance within the policy. And it seems to me that the important points are that the balancing exercise is undertaken if it's appropriate to do so. And importantly, that the necessary great or considerable weight is given to the section 66 statutory duty when the balancing exercise is undertaken. The next case that has considered Bramshill and the consequences of the Court of Appeals reasoning in Bramshill is um, London Historic Parks, um, which was a statutory challenge to the grant of planning permission for the Holocaust Memorial. And the applicant for planning permission was the Secretary of State um, for Housing Communities and Local Government. And ground one um, was that the inspector and then the minister had applied the wrong legal test to the issue of whether there would be substantial harm caused to heritage assets within Victoria Tower Gardens. Um, the Secretary of State, so the applicant for planning permission, had contended that for substantial harm, 
um, very much, if not all of the significance had to be drained away, or the asset significance had to be vitiated altogether or very much reduced. And those of you who are familiar um, with this line of case law will realize that's a reference to the Bedford case. The local planning authority had relied on paragraph 18 of the PPG to argue that there would be substantial harm if the adverse impact seriously affected a key element of the asset's special architectural or historic significance. The inspector took the view that bearing in mind that paragraph 18 of the PPG had been formulated in the light of Bedford, there wasn't uh, much to call between the two interpretations and decided that the serious degree of harm to the asset significance was the key test, noting um, that substantial harm was a high test indeed. Mrs Justice Thornton held that the inspector had come to his own interpretation of the relevant test for substantial harm, namely the serious degree of harm to the asset significance. Um, there was no objection in the High Court from the claimant to that formulation, which Mrs Justice Thornton considered reflected the PPG, and no issue was taken either with the inspector having equated substantial to mean serious, or with the fact that the inspector had stated that substantial harm is a high test, which it obviously is. Um, so, Mrs. Justice Lang held that the inspector, sorry, Mrs. Justice Thornton held that the inspector had not erroneously applied a test of significance draining away um, and hadn't erroneously relied on Bedford. Um, she considered that the approach taken was entirely consistent with that set out by the Court of Appeal in Bramshill. Um, and the reference here is to paragraph 74 of the judgment in Bramshill, which I've set out in full here. But in summary, what was said in Bramshill is that what amounts to substantial harm or less than substantial harm in a particular case will always depend on the circumstances, whether there will be harm and whether it's substantial or less than substantial are matters of fact and planning judgment. And there's no one approach suitable for every proposal affecting a designated heritage asset or its setting. And Mrs Justice Thornton noted that strictly speaking that passage in Bramsell is obiter because of the facts of the case um, but it's clear from her judgment that she considers that it's correct and I agree with her remark here about the recent line of case law authority from the Court of Appeal that emphasizes the self-effacing role of the court. The overarching trend that I see in recent court decisions on heritage is that the court is happy to leave matters to the decision makers planning judgment unless statute policy or guidance clearly mandates a more directive approach. And um, those of you who know Brands Hill and have had to deal with the other aspect where the court debates whether there should be an internal or an external heritage balance and essentially concludes that it doesn't matter which way it's done, um, we'll know what I'm talking about. Finally, on London Historic Parks, um, we can put the debate about Bedford, which I know has raised its head in a number of planning appeals, to bed um, in the light of the confirmation from the High Court that Bedford isn't saying anything that's at odds with what the Court of Appeal said in Bramshill. Um, the final case on Bramshill is um, a very recent decision from the beginning of this month, um, the Newcastle case, which is a judgment of Mr Justice Holgate, and again a Section 288 challenge to the Grant of Planning Commission on appeal, this time a challenge to the approach taken to the effect of the scheme on the setting of a Grade 1 listed church. Um, it was common ground at the inquiry that any harm to the setting of the church was less than substantial and not substantial. Um, Historic England and the local planning authority contended for a moderate, moderate degree of less than substantial harm. The developer ultimately um, argued that there was no harm. The inspector disagreed with Historic England and with the local planning authority and decided that the harm caused would be towards the lower end of the less than substantial harm category. And this was the critical aspect of the case, in part because of the key constraints of the plot. So the council who was the claimant successfully argued that the inspector's conclusion on the level of less than substantial harm was impermissibly based amongst other things on her conclusion that the level of harm couldn't be further minimized by a different design and I will say that I don't think the outcome of this one is surprising because it seems clear to me that the level of harm caused by a scheme is what it is and whether a different design would be less harmful doesn't alter the level of harm caused by the proposed design. 
And that point was picked up by Mr Justice Holgate when he discussed um, GPA 3, which will be familiar to many of you. Step 3 is the assessment of the effects on significance and then step 4 requires um, ways in which harm could be minimised to be explored. But Mr Justice Holgate held that the considerations under step four were relevant to the balance between any heritage harm caused by the scheme and the benefits of the scheme and not to the assessment of harm that the scheme would cause. So the conclusion in Newcastle was that the inspector had gone wrong in law because she had taken into account a legally irrelevant consideration when reaching her judgment on the level of harm that the scheme itself would cause. The fact that it couldn't be minimised through a different design was not relevant to the judgment on the level of harm. Um, there's another aspect of this case that I expect will be revisited in due course. The claimant argued that the inspector had failed to give cogent and compelling reasons for departing from historic England's view on the level of harm that the scheme would cause. And as you'll see from the slide, Mr Justice Holgate expressed substantial reservations about whether the case law authorities that were relied upon, which was the Exeter Shadwell line of case law, um, actually establishes the principle that where a statutory consultee has given its advice, the decision maker has to give great weight to that opinion. And if it departs from that opinion, should give cogent and compelling reasons for doing so. Um, now, I know that it's been argued on many occasions that the case law, you know, the line of case law authority does establish that proposition. I'm pretty sure that I'm one of the people that has run that argument previously, but Mr Justice Holgate um, wasn't convinced by it. We will have to wait, though, to find out um, where this point goes because the issue wasn't resolved in the Newcastle case. Mr Justice Holgate hadn't received full argument on the point and he didn't determine it. Instead, he concluded that the inspector's departure from Historic England's advice was in any event infected by her error in relation to um, the level of harm, which we've already discussed. Moving on from Bramshill to Kinsey, um, as some of you will probably know, there was a case um, before Mrs Justice Lang in 2021 brought by Ms Kinsey, um, in which planning permission for residential scheme was quashed and was then remitted to the local planning authority for redetermination. Planning permission was granted on that redetermination in August last year. And again, Ms Kinsey um, brought a legal challenge and judicial review of the second grant of planning permission. Um, in my view, I must say, I think Lewis and the local planning authority had a somewhat narrow escape here from having to redetermine the application for a third time. Um, the first round of challenge concerned optimum viable use, which, as many of you will know, um, appears in paragraph 202 of the MPPF, where it said that um, less than substantial harm must be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal, including, where appropriate, securing its optimum viable use. And that paragraph in the MPPF is supported by the planning practice guidance. Um, Mr Justice Fordham analysed the MPPF and the PPG, um, which he took to be the two key sources, and <clears throat> sets out four distinctive features of optimum viable use, applicability, method, idea and consequence. And I've set out his reasoning there. There's nothing particularly controversial about it um, as far as I can see. Optimum viable use only applies where your scheme entails a proposed use of a designated heritage asset. Then the method, as we've noted, is that if you've got less than substantial harm to the significance of a designated heritage asset, you, you get a balance sheet, as he called it, um, a list of public benefits of the proposal, and you can include securing the OVU within that if it's appropriate. In his view, and I agree, inclusion is appropriate where the scheme would involve securing the optimum viable use of the designated heritage asset. Um, as to the idea, as he, as he put it, optimum viable use means that the economically viable use of the heritage asset that is likely to cause the least heritage harm and the consequence if um, the optimum viable use aspect of paragraph 202 is engaged is that optimum viable use can stand in the balance sheet 
as one of the public benefits weighing against any less than substantial harm to the significance of the designated heritage assets. So, so far, um, relatively straightforward application of the MPPF and the PPG. Now, on the facts, this wasn't actually a case in which optimum viable use could be included in the balance sheet list of benefits because the scheme didn't involve the use of a designated heritage asset and nobody actually, um, including the applicant for planning permission, was trying to evidence that it wasn't possible to identify an alternative scheme that would be less harmful in heritage terms, but still viable. Peculiarly, um, therefore, reference was made to the scheme securing the optimum viable use of the site in the officer's report, and perhaps unsurprisingly, the claimant argued that the officer's report had misled members um, because there was reference to the OVU when actually that concept wasn't engaged on the facts. But Mr Justice Fordham held that the officer's report hadn't been misleading. Um, in essence, he took the view that the reference to the optimum viable use in the officer's report was simply a reference to the scheme being viable and delivering the optimum use of the site. Um, the officer's report he, he considered had not misled members by suggesting that there was no alternative scheme that was less harmful in heritage terms, but still viable. And, and that's the issue that paragraph 202 of the MPPF is, is, is addressing through the concept of optimum viable use. Um, and we, you can see what he said here, a policy appreciating committee member who understands how the MPPF and the PPG operate would understand that OVU is inapplicable because the scheme didn't entail the use of a designated heritage asset. He also noted that OVU hasn't been included in the officer's balance sheet lists of public benefits. Um, and as I've said, the reference to OVU in the officer report, um, Mr Justice Fordham considered to be a message about the optimum use of the site delivered by a development that was viable. There wasn't any kind of comparative analysis of the respective heritage harms that would result from potential viable uses of the site. Um, Notwithstanding that um, the sequel to Kinsey um, was dismissed on this ground, I would strongly advise against including references to OVU in an officer report or any other document for that matter, unless you do mean OVU in the sense um, referred to in paragraph 202 of the MPPF, so the heritage sense, because otherwise um, I think you might find yourself sort of having the similar debate to that that was undertaken in the Kinsey sequel. Um, there is, I think, room for an argument that, you know, if the facts have been different and it had been less clear from the officer's report what the context was, then um, the outcome might have been different for Lewisham. Anyway, that's um, everything that I have for you on heritage case law from the past 12 months. So I'll hand over now to Nick. Thanks for listening. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have to start with the same apology as Heather, this has not been a groundbreaking year for development plan challenges. We're all, I think, familiar with the litany of withdrawn plans and amended plans and forgotten plans that's happened over the last year as various politicians in central government have given their different views and different indications. So the result is that there hasn't been a huge amount of plan making activity over the last year. Um, these stats are from PINs, the core strategy adoptions in 2022. As you can see, they sit on a slide, and these are the other strategies adopted in the last year, and those two fit on one slide. So lawyers clearly here losing out, um, and the biggest victim, obviously, of all this toing and froing. The result is that at a macro level, there haven't been any substantive judgments under Section 113 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004 this year. Um, there is there have been certain challenges, but they've tended to be knocked out at permission stage, like the uh, Windsor and Maidenhead challenge that got knocked out last Wednesday, um, and challenges to neighbourhood plans under Section 61N. We've had one that's gone to substantive judgment. Um, there is a Supreme Court case from last year on timings. Um, many of you are probably relatively familiar with it, but in terms of the key issues that I want to address, I want to start with timings and a brief refresher of that. Um, with the filed case and the reason is one of the reasons that the local um, plan got knocked out last week um, was was it was filed late. Um, so 
it's helpful to be very clear on what the timings are. Then I want to talk about the one substantive decision we've had on Section 61, which is the Park Lane decision this year, and that deals helpfully with what are strategic policies and their questions of procedural fairness in the neighbourhood plan making process. So let's, these both relate to neighbourhood plans. So it's helpful, I think, to start off with just a very brief reminder that, as summarised in file, there are seven key stages to making a neighbourhood plan designating an area, pre-submission preparation of, of the plan, submission of a proposal to the LPA, uh, consideration by an examiner, then the LPA considers the examiner's report, then there's a referendum, then the plan or order is made. So, um, Section 61N, as a brief reminder, this provides for public law challenges to be brought at each of stages five, six, and seven. So that's considering the report, holding a referendum or making the order or plan. And that imposes two requirements. First, the claim has to be brought by way of JR. Second, the claim form has to be filed within six weeks of the day after either the decision is published or the referendum is declared, uh, whichever step you're concerned with. So the issue uh, that was raised in filed is can you launch a challenge within time at say stage seven that relates to actually substantive procedural irregularity at for example stage five and that's what came up in the supreme court case um, we'll all i think be familiar with the, the the general tension in planning cases which is if, if you think there's been a, a misstep on the way to a decision do you wait for the decision to come out um, or do you challenge it then and there um, now the facts aren't overly material um, in file, I've set out the various stages on your slide. Um, the key point here is the underlying challenge uh, was whether there was about ecological issues and how to take them into account. The examiner has suggested various ecological issues in the neighbourhood plan um, could be dealt with because they'd have to be dealt with at application stage um, and the local authority had considered that and gone with that view at stage five. We then get to, there was then a referendum then the plan was made, then the JR was issued um, of the neighbourhood plan, suggesting that actually uh, you can't just deal with ecological issues, SPAs, habitats, regulations issues, for example, at, um, uh, at application stage, you've got to understand where they fit when making the plan. Now, so the issue was that the claim was issued within one day um, of the time limit for step seven. So it was in time for that, but it was well outside uh, the time limit for step five. Um, the High Court dismissed it as out of time, the Court of Appeal dismissed it as out of time, so then it came to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court uh, dismissed it as out of time. Uh, I won't go through all of the detailed reasoning with you, but the key point is this. Um, it start against the background where you can challenge, you can launch public law JR challenges at pretty much any step of the process. The purpose of Section 61N is restrictive. It limits, it introduces limits on how you can challenge stages five, six, and seven. One of those limits is six weeks, and there is no statutory right to extend, in contrast to the standard, of course, JR position, um, where it's brought promptly or within six weeks, where there is this, this, this residual discretion if required. So you go through a three step process. You look at substantively does the challenge in question question a decision which is within stages five or six or seven? Then is it all within JR? then is it brought within six weeks of that particular date. What you cannot do is impugn a decision at stage seven by reference to actually an alleged deficiency that happened much, much earlier at stage five. So that's timing. Um, just a brief reminder, as I said, but helpful to keep in mind. So moving on to the next two issues, is, uh, the guidance or the helpful guidance that comes up um, relates to strategic policies and procedural fairness. Now, as many of you know, if you're looking to challenge a, um, uh, uh, or one of the, sorry, one of the questions that the examiner has to consider um, is whether the draft neighbourhood plan meets what's called the basic conditions. I've put two of those are prescribed in statute. I've put two of them on the slide there. The first is having regard to national policies and advice contained in guidance issued by the Secretary of State. It is appropriate to make the order. The second is that the making of the order is in general conformity with the strategic policies contained in the development plan. Now, both of those would squarely put an issue in uh, the Park Lane Homes case. Now, to understand this, I'm afraid we've got to go through 
the policy and the background facts in a little bit more detail than I'd usually like in a presentation, but I'm hoping it helps. So the policy position is this. Um, this claim concerned a site that was designated as VL1 in the district plan in 2006. Um, I think just for your reference that halfway through these slides, I switched to LV1, but that's just because I spent far too much time watching the LV car insurance adverts. It is in fact VL1. Um, the core strategy comes along in 2014 and it supersedes that plan, but it saves policy VL1. The core strategy also lists a number of strategic policies in the low 2006 plan, which are now superseded. We get overall spatial development strategies, OSS1, which says we need 5,700 homes, um, and some of that is going to be in villages. We get OSS2, which says we're going to keep using development boundaries, and then we're going to, and then there's OSS3, which lays out particular factors that are considered um, in suitability of an area for development. Fast forward to 2019, um, the housing delivery is not great, it's about 2.79 years supply, so we get the development and site allocations plan in 2019. Now policy OVE1 in this later plan says basically until you have a neighbourhood plan for a particular settlement with a core strategy housing requirement, then applications will be favourably considered if they A, contribute to meeting the housing target, and then B, are otherwise compliant with OSS2, um, development boundaries and OSS3, those general factors for considering the suitability of an area. Um, and then you get DR policy DIM2, which is about development boundaries. So that's the policy framework that we're dealing with, and that's going to come important later down the line. What are the facts? Well, C owns. The land on which uh, L, or at least part of the land on which policy VL1 sits. It's got outlined planning permission um, for up to 30 dwellings, but then it's made subsequent applications, full applications um, for uh, planning permission and for the discharge of reserve matters conditions, and those were dismissed on, among other things, impact on AOMB grounds. Parish Council starts to bring forward its local plan, takes consultation, um, submits to the council in 2020 and the local plan at that point says yes we need 52 houses in our village that's right that echoes the requirements in the earlier stages of the plan um but it doesn't make any allocations at all including lv uh including any allocation that echoes vl1 so 52 houses yes this site no um the claimant objected. He says this doesn't mean the basic conditions. It fails to allocate any size for housing. The strategic policies in the plan say you've got to. And then it fails to expand the development boundary for housing to include the whole of the site, because of course the development boundaries were only across parts of the site. Um, the council considers that, puts in a detailed representation to the examiner. The examiner publishes his report. Um, and that is then subject to a very long letter provide, uh, by the claimant that's forwarded to the council who forwards it to the examiner. Um, the examiner publishes his final report and says, uh, yep, they've not allocated sites, but actually that's probably appropriate because the sites you want allocated have already been refused on AOMB impact grounds. So it's a perfectly acceptable um, version of the, of the plan not to allocate sites. But introduce a reference to OVE1 into the draft neighbourhood plan because that's your um, that's your catch-all, that's your filter, that's your okay if no sites, we can still treat housing favourably to show we're trying to meet that need for 52 houses in this village. Um, a development boundary should be modified but the majority of sites already is within it so don't worry too much um, and overall the examiner concluded the basic conditions were met. This then went to the council's chief executive and he, exercising delegated authority, made the decision to recommend the modifications and that it proceed to referendum, didn't go out and consult, just said, yeah, fair enough, let's crack on. So that was the subject of the JR in this case. Ground one of the JR um, is that the council erred in exam accepting the examiner's findings that the neighbor plan met the basic conditions. So having regard to the MPPF and the PPG, that it was appropriate to make the plan and that the making of the plan was in general conformity with the strategic policy. So basic conditions A and E. Ground two is procedural fairness saying we should have been given represent uh, opportunities to make representations on the examiner's reports before the chief executive decided to adopt it. We also threw in a whole host of other procedural fairness concerns saying, well, the examiner should have hosted a hearing because we want one um, and things of that ilk. 
Basic condition A, this isn't particularly groundbreaking, but it's worth just touching on. Um, the court reiterated that when you're looking at basic condition A, the examiner is not undertaking a kind of soundness or justification test that it does for, for other policies in the development plan. It is differently worded. It is a having regard to national policy and guidance. Um, and looking at that national policy and the PPG, Nothing requires an able plan to allocate housing sites. It is a choice, um, and so it wasn't irrational to conclude that the neighbourhood plan had had regard to the NPPF and the PPG, where it accepted the need for homes, including those homes in this village, and it said, uh, "Okay, well, as our as our safety valve, we'll have OVE one." So that wasn't irrational. That's fine. Basic condition E, and these particular paragraphs are helpful, I think, um, for those who are involved in any sort of, of neighbourhood plan challenge, because it includes a quite helpful detailed analysis of whether a policy is a strategic policy or not for the purposes of basic condition E, and includes a number of helpful examples as to how that plays out in practice. Um, so the starting point is that whether there is general conformity, and that's the test, with strategic policies, that's the key word, is a matter of fact and planning judgment. So we're in kind of um, irrationality evaluation territory. Now, the starting point is to identify, unsurprisingly, those strategic policies. And for that, the court looked at um, guidance in the NPPF. Uh, so that distinguishes between strategic policies, which set out an overall strategy for the pattern, scale, quality of development, and make sufficient provision for housing. Um, plans should make clear which is strategic, and uh, then there you get to non-strategic policies, which are those used by LPAs to set out more detailed policies for speak, spe sorry, specific areas, neighbourhoods, or types of development. And this can include site allocations for, say, housing. So we get on to the arguments. Um, first, claimant argued that policy VL1 is a strategic policy. This was dismissed out of hand. It's not listed in the core strategy as a superseded strategic policy. And also as a housing allocation, it kind of falls four square within the definition um, of a non-strategic policy. So that's out. The claimant then argued that DIM2 and OVE1, so DIM2 recall was the development boundaries in the site allocation plan, and OVE1 was that safety valve in the site allocation plan. So those are strategic policies. Court dismissed. Um, DIM2 implements, the, it implements the strategic policy on development boundaries, but it's OSS2 that's the strategic policy here. Um, and then OVE1 relates to specific areas. Now, it doesn't say areas A, B, and C. What it says is those areas without a neighborhood plan. And it doesn't change the strategy. It's a default mechanism. It's a safety valve. So again, that's not a strategic policy. Um, the claimant then argued, we're getting more adventurous, that even if VL1, DM2, and OVE1 aren't strategic policies, they affect the interpretation um, of policy RA1 and the core strategy. Now, sorry, I, I meant to go through RA1, but after you get OSS1, which says we need 5,700 homes, and OSS2, which includes the development boundaries, and OSS3, which sets out the factors in considering the suitability of an area, RA1 was a policy in the core strategy which said, we will have 50 odd develop uh, 50 odd houses in this particular village in Burwash. So it's the, the claimant at this point says, okay, well, you affects the interpretation of RA1. That too was dismissed. Um, condition E requires conformity with the strategic policies, not the development plan as a whole. Um, the core strategic policies are in the core strategy, um, and DS, the DSA 19 postdates that it's not a strategic policy in itself. So overall, the court said, look, it's reasonable for the examiner and the council to have concluded the neighbourhood didn't challenge the strategic need for development in Burwash, there are no policies preventing the delivery of residential growth at an appropriate site, and the default mechanism uh, applies. Overall, that's fine. Ground two, which is the procedural fairness ground, was also dismissed in, uh, it's got to be said, pretty short order. Now, as I've uh, teed up at the start, there were a number of particular challenges. The main one was that the chief executive should have consulted before making a decision on the examiner's report. Um, the answer to that was no. Um, it, it, the, there was only a statutory obligation if, if they were going, if the chief executive was going to, or the council was going to depart from the examiner's report. Um, Otherwise, the claimant had ample opportunity during the process 
uh, to make representations, including its lengthy representation that was made after the examiner's interim report and before the examiner's final report, which the examiner looked at. There had been a suggestion that the claimant wanted to be personally notified by someone at the council when the decision was made um, in what will come as some relief to those of you on the call from local authorities. The court said, no, that is far too much. Um, the local authority is busy. It was in the time preparing its local plan review. You cannot expect to be personally notified. Look on the website like everybody else. Um, uh, and as to the suggestion that the examiner should have held an oral hearing, the uh, neighbourhood plan examination process is almost entirely written. And again, the, the, you're into Wednesday rationality territory and deciding whether to hold a local hearing. The examiner's decision not to in this case was fine. So that's a roundup uh, from me and I'll hand over to Alex. As I said, nothing overly groundbreaking, some helpful guidance though, um, on particularly the, the application of the neighbourhood plan, um, the various stages in the neighbourhood plan process. Hello, uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, Equality Act and planning. I'm going to begin uh, rather unashamedly with uh, just quoting from section 149 because contrary to popular belief, the best way of understanding section 149 of the Equality Act and what it requires is just to read it and most of it, most of it is in there. So section 149 says this, uh, a public authority must in the exercise of its functions have due regard to the need to eliminate discrimination, harassment, victimization, and any other conduct that is prohibited under the Equality Act 2010. B, it must uh, have due regard to the need to advance equality of opportunity between persons who share a relevant protective characteristic and persons who do not share it. And C, it must have due regard to the need to foster good relations between persons who share a relevant protected characteristic and persons who do not share it. Having due regard, so section 1493 says, having due regard to the need to advance equality of opportunity between persons who share a relevant protected characteristic and persons who do not share it, involves having due regard, in particular to the need to A, remove or minimise disadvantages suffered by persons who share a relevant protected characteristic that are connected to that characteristic. B, take steps to meet the needs of persons who share a relevant protected characteristic that are different from the needs of persons who do not share it. And C, encourage persons who share a relevant protected characteristic to participate in public life or in any other activity in which participation by such persons is disproportionately low. So, to understand what that means then, we can turn to some of the case law. Uh, a very helpful uh, explanation of it was set out in the case of Buckley and Bath against uh, Bath and North East Somerset Council, uh, explained as, as follows. The duty is a duty to have due regard to the specified matters, not a duty to achieve a specific result. The duty is one of substance, not form. And the real issue is whether the relevant public authority has in substance had regard to the relevant matters, taking into account the nature of the decision and the public authority's reasoning. So we'll, we'll come to see that shortly uh, as an important set of uh, components, whether in substance regard has been had. You don't have to do any particular form. Uh, what matters is that there was indeed due regard uh, and that the scope of what due regard requires depends on the fact sensitive nature of the inquiry. So in some contexts, it will require much more than in others. The absence of a reference to the public sector equality duty will not of itself necessarily mean that the decision maker failed to have regard to the relevant matters, although it is good practice to make reference to the duty and evidently useful in, demonstrate, in demonstrating discharge of the duty. Uh, case of Bridges 2020, explained the scope of the PSED duty. A court of appeal said, we acknowledge that what is required by the PSED is dependent on the context and does not require the impossible. It requires the taking of reasonable steps to make inquiries about what may not yet be known to a public authority about the potential impact of a proposed decision or policy on people with the relevant characteristics, in particular for present purposes, race and sex. So looking at what's happened in the last year, uh, one of the most significant decisions was the case of Shake against the London Borough of Lambeth, 
This went to the High Court and then uh, recently to the Court of Appeal. It was a challenge to low traffic neighbourhoods. Uh, it was ultimately it failed. It was brought by a disabled resident who alleged that the closing of roads, in essence, disadvantaged her uh, ability to move about uh, in her borough. Uh, the Court of Appeal there made some observations on the scope of the duty. What is due regard in one case will not necessarily be due regard in another. It will vary perhaps widely according to circumstances. For example, the subject matter of the decision being made, the timing of that decision, its place in a sequence of decision making to which it belongs, the period for which it will be in effect, the nature and scale of its particular consequence and so forth. So again, we can see that uh, there's a variable and facts, highly fact sensitive uh, standard applied. The um, shape case, uh, clearly, if you follow the news and read them, particularly the London newspapers, the low traffic neighbourhoods have been uh, very uh, controversial. Uh, they were made originally uh, in the COVID, uh, at the beginning of the COVID emergency, they were made as emergency orders uh, pursuant to government guidance, uh, which had the, and they had the effect of restricting traffic through Lambeth, as in many other boroughs. The purpose of them was to promote walking and cycling and discourage motor vehicles. Um, but clearly that has a, a much greater impact on disabled residents than um, the able-bodied uh, section of the public. Uh, and so uh, Ms. Shade said that her life had been made much difficult, more difficult by the uh, introduction of these and, and alleged the failure to comply with the Section 149 Public Sector Equality Duty. Uh, ultimately, equality impact assessments were issued for each of the low traffic neighbourhoods, but uh, and, and they were very detailed. But the judge in the first instance said, well, there is a lot of information on uh, in those assessments, which the decision maker was not aware of at the time of making the orders, uh, but that does not mean that there was a, a, an omission in terms of the duty to have due regard, uh, because in substance they gave enough consideration to the questions, uh, even in the absence of those impact assessments. Uh, it's quite a um, interesting judgment on the question of rolling assessment, rolling basis assessment, because it's a case where new factors were emerging uh, throughout a lengthy process. Uh, on the appeal, uh, the appeal was dismissed, um, uh, the court saying it was a, a very fact sensitive question, what due regard required, uh, and of course it would be less demanding where the decision came early in a sequence of decisions uh, where all the detail was not yet apparent. Um, and that could be especially so where a decision was uh, experimental, as in these cases. Um, it was also a factor in the decision that the process was more conducive to a more robust uh, assessment of equality impacts later in the process. And so the fact that as matters went on, there'd be review uh, stood in favour of upholding the original decisions. Uh, so that's shaken Lambeth. That's probably the most significant decision this this year. Um, the case of Huff is one I acted in um, in the High Court earlier this year, uh, a judgment of Mrs. Justice Leaven, and this concerned a challenge by judicial review to the grant of planning permission by special development order, which of itself is a pretty interesting. Uh, context because uh, there have been very few judicial review challenges to the use of special development orders. Um, special development orders are provided for by section 59 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990. They have been most recently prior to the Huff case used for the Brexit car parks in Kent, but there have only been a few dozen in the whole history of um, the provision and its predecessors, which the previous Town and Country Planning Acts all contained a similar uh, kind of power to make special development orders, that it involves laying a statutory instrument in Parliament, which the Home Office in this case, the sponsoring department, did uh, in the summer vacation. 
in the middle of August, but my clients were astute enough to uh, bring a challenge before the order, in fact, took effect. The order in this question, in this case, granted planning permission for the use of Napier barracks, a former military barracks, uh, for accommodation of asylum seekers. And the uh, use was an ongoing use. There had been a, a one year use, a use of which the Home Office had relied on uh, uh, permitted development rights for. But at the expiry of that, they, they sought to get planning permission through the special development order and effectively granted it to themselves. But they didn't conduct uh, a fresh equality assessment under section 149. They relied on the previous assessment, which had related to the one year use. And so the argument was that where you're setting up something which really is the very sort of development that requires uh, an equality impact assessment, i.e. putting a segregated population of young uh, men, exclusively foreign, within a, a domestic population. Uh, that was just the sort of thing that the Act was designed to ensure uh, consideration was given to. Uh, because, of course, 1491C uh, focuses particularly on uh, community relations between people who share characteristics and those who don't. Uh, it wasn't enough to simply say, well, when you looked at it under a temporary planning permission, uh, there didn't seem to be any particular issues that couldn't be overcome. And you can rely on that for now what is going to be a five year use of the site, because as the judge then went on to hell to hold uh, pressure on services over five years were greater risks related to harassment and victimization of the asylum seekers uh, tensions with the local community, they would all be exacerbated over the five year period in a way that they wouldn't have been over the one year period and so uh, she allowed the claim on that ground. Uh, other cases where a judicial review has been brought and succeeded on a ground involving the public sector equality duty include these two, Buckley uh, and Danny. Buckley was about the partial de demolition and rebuild of an estate, and the local planning authority gave no regard to the impact on elderly residents of losing their homes and whether the impact was greater for those who didn't share. Uh, particular characteristics and so outline planning permission was quashed. Danning uh, is an interesting case because uh, it was simply about planning permission involving the loss of a local village pub, so quite a, a small development which shows the extent of uh, section 149 duty uh, and Ms Justice Stain held that there was a failure to fulfil the section 149 duty on the basis of a complete absence of evidence relating to consideration of the impact of the proposed change of use from pub to residential uh, on persons with protected characteristics. Uh, two more cases which have succeeded raising those grounds, one called Williams and Caffilly, claimant successfully challenged a decision to close a leisure centre. The court held the council had failed to have regard to the impact of closure of the leisure centre on elderly and disabled residents. And the other is LDRA Limited and Sector State for communities and local government, where the court wasn't satisfied that the inspector had, had had any regard to the impact of the development on disabled people of the loss of a car park, which was used to access the River Mersey and planning permission was quashed. Um, I've given a couple of examples next of decisions where the planning permission was upheld. Uh, Gathercole is a decision in the Court of Appeal and it's an important decision on section 31 2a of the Senior Courts Act 1981, which says that the court should not quash a planning permission or other decision uh, where it's highly likely that but for the error, the same decision would have eventuated. The case in question uh, was an application to build a new primary school and the local planning authority hadn't had regard to aircraft noise uh, and its impact on children with protected characteristics. Another case where the decision was upheld, not quashed, was a case called Lakenheath Parish Council and Suffolk. That was a decision to grant planning permission for a new primary school. Uh, it was upheld because the section 149 duty was discharged in substance, even though an officer's report failed to mention it. Uh, and then I've also listed a case called Coleman and Barnett, um, goes back a while that case, uh, 
uh, a claim under section 149 was dismissed on the basis the council had done everything required of it under section 149 in replace in weighing up the replacement of a garden center uh, um, used by elderly and disabled people uh, final point really on section 149 is that it is a successor to section 71 of the race relations act 1976 and so there's a a, a body of case law which the courts have regard to under that predecessor provision uh, because it was in very similar terms and essentially the same duty applied. I've then uh, set out something about burden of proof uh, under the Act, uh, section 136, uh, and the recent case of Smith in the Court of Appeal, which is about gypsies and travellers, which I'll come back to. Uh, deals with questions of burden of proof, although not specifically with section 136. Uh, and then in my slides, I'm going to zoom through these, um, but uh, just deal with Smith first of all. Smith and the Secretary of State for Leveling Up uh, went to the Court of Appeal, uh, a recent decision. Uh, and in that case, a decision refusing planning permission for a gypsy site by a planning inspector was quashed. And that was because the policy uh, excluded gypsies, so government national policy excluded gypsies who settled as a result of old age or disability. So they gave up traveling. And the government policy says, well, if you've given up traveling, you're no longer of a nomadic habit of life. And so they didn't fall within the definition any longer of nomadic people who uh, benefit from certain policies related to gypsy and traveler sites. Uh, the there was a PSED analysis, but the court said that uh, in relation to a discrimination claim, so the gypsies claimed they were subject to indirect discrimination as a result of this policy, uh, the state relied on the uh, uh, equality impact assessment it had done, but the court said it was apparent on the face of the PSED analysis that the relevant statutory considerations in section 1491 were not met it seems an unpromising starting point for the suggestion that the, relevant ex that the relevant exclusion would achieve fairness to note that at the outset, the advice of the Secretary of State was that the relevant exclusion did not eliminate discrimination, did not advance equality of opportunity between persons who shared a relevant protected characteristic and persons who did not share it and did not foster good relations between persons who shared the relevant protected characteristic and persons who did not share it. So that was a case where the allegation was one of indirect discrimination under section 19, but the justification that the government uh, advanced sought to rely on an attempt to discharge the section 149 duty. And the court said, well, you didn't discharge it properly. So that doesn't justify the indirect discrimination. So it's quite a helpful case in showing how different components of the Equality Act can interrelate in discrimination based challenges. So it's not a simply a matter of looking at section 149, Section 149 itself refers back to forms of discrimination and protected characteristics, and you have to look elsewhere in the Act for those. And when you're looking at either direct or indirect discrimination claims, uh, Section 149 duty and its discharge can, can be relevant to uh, the, the questions that arise under those. So I've just given the definition of direct discrimination, and the following slides will just set out for your notes, really. Uh, I won't go into detail now but uh, the other components of the Equality Act, which are not specifically within the scope of this talk, uh, dealing with direct discrimination and indirect. So direct discrimination is under section 31. That's what it sounds like, where you treat someone less favorably uh, than you would treat others because of a particular characteristic. So uh, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, then I've given an example of a case where it arose, but, uh, was not uh, was not upheld the, the claim there it's a case called Fraser uh, and it was about discrimination on age grounds saying that giving uh, older people uh, in a residential development less uh, open space was discriminatory uh, another direct discrimination case was called Proudfoot it goes back a long time um, and that was uh, about um, uh, article one protocol one read with article 14 uh, which I'll come back to in a second, uh, and it was a development of, of housing. Uh, again, that was uh, held to be justified. And uh, indirect discrimination, section 19 of the Equality Act 
uh, I've set out there. And there's a few cases on that. More is one of them about travellers. Article 14 I've set out there. That's another form of discrimination under the Human Rights Act, which we need to be aware of. Uh, and then Connor's uh, distinction between unlawfulness of the decision to recover the appeal and the substantive planning decision needed to be borne in mind. So I think we now move on to the questions. I do have some questions that have arisen partially through what uh, some people have raised in the question and answer section of the uh, of the web page, but I also have some other questions as well that I was um, interested in understanding. And um, perhaps I can direct my question uh, to Nick first. Uh, Nick, hi. Um, can I just understand this in relation uh, to the stage at which one brings a challenge to a development plan? Is there any? Or are there any sort of practical tips that you can give to those who are online as to uh, how to approach that that uh, issue? Sure. I mean, substantively, it's all about understanding in practice what is the decision that's being challenged and where in the process it it falls. So um, the courts have been pretty clear, particularly in challenging the plan points. You can't obviously you can't wait till the end, but um, I anticipate they're not going to be overly sympathetic to trying to work in a. a you know, a stage five challenge at stage six either. Um, there doesn't seem, they, they don't seem to have kicked up too much of a fuss about the fact that, um, you know, inspector reaches, uh, sorry, examiner reaches one view and then the local authority goes with that view. Is that really a challenge to what the local authority does or is that really a challenge to what the inspector's done? That seems to be so far all right. Um, but uh, so substantively just realistically if you step back on a practical basis where did the issue arise in which stage of the process that's really the nub of it good thanks so i mean just looking at it in overall terms i mean is there is there much clarity on the basis of the case law as we have it and um, as to how one goes about challenging uh, the relevant plans um certainly at stages five six and seven on, on neighborhood plans i think that the supreme court's now been pretty clear on that and that's probably quite settled um Earlier stages slightly less so, it appears from the, the because section 61 and doesn't really make much provision for that. So it appears you're in ordinary JR land rather than the, the restrictive type of JR land that section 61 and outlines. Good, thank you. Thanks very much for that, Nick. Um, Heather, I, there are a couple of issues that have arisen um, that I want to deal with. The first um, concerns the Newcastle case. And a question has been asked um, that if the inspector uh, hadn't been seeking to understand where the harm was on a spectrum, um, she wouldn't have ended up uh, in the area that she had. Uh, can you um, provide your answer on that, please? Um, yes, I think that is probably correct in that, um, you know, the error was all to do with where she put the level of harm within the category of less than substantial harm. But the difficulty that she would have then faced if she had just said it is less than substantial harm and hadn't gone any further is that, um, the PPG explains that you're supposed to articulate where within the category the level of harm falls. And actually the first Kinsey case, not the one I was talking about, but the one from last year, um, Mrs. Justice Lang basically um, refers to that. And she, you know, she says the PPG is only guidance, not policy, but nevertheless, you should follow it um, unless you've got a convincing reason not to. So I don't think it's wise really to sort of take the view that you don't have to articulate where within the category you fall, you should do it. And yeah, unfortunately, she just shouldn't have relied on the absence of a of an alternative that was less damaging when she was looking at the level of the harm. But, um, just a slightly different point, with regard to the Kinsey decision, um, uh, can you just um, give your view as to whether or not uh, you think that the I, I hope Heather, can you hear me all right? I can now. I missed that the question. Sorry, oh, good. Um, it was really whether or not the Kinsey decision was right in your view, whether you can give any um, indication of that. 
Yeah, it's um, it was interesting, actually. I was reading through it and I thought I was reading that the judge had agreed with the claimant that the, the reference to OVU in the officer report shouldn't have been there and did amount to an error of law. Um, it doesn't happen that often to me, but I then realised I was reading the claimant's submissions, not the judge's conclusion. So I actually was quite surprised when I got to the end of the judgment and found that um, the claimant hadn't succeeded on that ground. But overall, I do think the, the outcome is correct when you... It is one of those instances of taking, you know, a particular reference in an officer report in isolation. It does give you, a, and I think the judge did find the argument convincing, just not ultimately convincing enough. But I think when you look at just the reference to over you in the officer report, you think, oh, something's gone wrong here. But then when you consider the other points, and particularly the fact that the officers didn't include over you as one of the benefits, I do think overall the judge was right to find that reading the report as a whole, which is what we've got to do, you know, they've done enough to mean that it, the reference could be explained away um, and wasn't enough to render the decision unlawful. Yes, thanks. And um, can I then, given uh, that time is um, not on our side, uh, can I uh, turn please to a couple of questions to Alex? Um, the first is um, whether the, um, public sector equality duty applies to every decision um, uh, to grant permission or not. Can you help on that, Alex, please? Uh, yes, as I sort of mentioned it a little in the talk, um, it in essence, it does in substance, but uh, I've gone through a number of the cases where uh, the courts have made clear it's a highly fact sensitive analysis. So, I mean, a good illustration of, of how small a decision can be is the Danning case where it was about change of use from pub to residential. It applied there and the whole the wholesale failure to have regard to that decision uh, to, 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 to the duty uh, was enough that the uh, judge found that decision to be unlawful. Um, that would of course be subject to all sorts of defences on well it would have made no difference etc in, in many cases. Um, but yeah in order to be safe you, you want to turn your mind in substance to questions of um, equality in any planning decision, exercising planning functions in any way. So practically speaking then, that needs to be something that any planning officer um, considering any application um, yeah. should bear in mind. Uh, indeed, and there should probably just be a, a, you know, a tick box at the end of, of, of the pro forma for the officer's report to make sure that they've done that. But uh, I, I don't suggest a, a tick box approach because the authorities explicitly say don't use a tick box approach, but the, to, as, a, as a reminder, and as then reminder. try and turn your mind to whether it raises any issues. I mean, often it'd be hard to think what they are, but you need to at least think, uh, think about the question. Thanks. The other issue concerns the Smith decision. Um, and uh, the consequences of the finding uh, that the Court of Appeal reached in that case. Um, and the, the question, to the particular question that's been raised is how that in, interacts or impacts upon a need assessment that will have to, of course, be undertaken by um, the relevant uh, planning authority. Um, can you give uh, any indication as to what, how you think it will play out in the con context well, of the need assessment? Yeah, I think the first thing to say about that is that the Court of Appeal was at pains both um, at the beginning of the judgment, paragraph six, and at the end, paragraphs 131 to 139, to make clear that their decision related only to the particular decision before them. So it only related to that particular appeal um, and that under section 288 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990, under which the High Court challenge was uh, issued, the court doesn't have jurisdiction to say anything broader than its view of the particular de decision in front of it. And so um, in various different ways, they try to assert that their decision will have no wider impact. However, um, the underlying fact of the case is that the Secretary of State actually conceded that the effect of her own policy was discriminatory um, and that the court then held there was no proper justification for its discriminatory effect on the uh, residents in question um, and questions are certainly raised about whether the policy seemed to be designed to exclude people deliberately from the ambit of um, a gypsy and traveller policies in order to make it easier to provide for the population as a whole and that that might be discriminatory so that clearly was going to raise a number of notes of caution for those preparing needs assessments where you're trying to base it on a policy that has been cast into doubt by the Court of Appeal. Yeah. 
Um, so I think that's going to be a tricky exercise and uh, the government itself would be you know, presumably considering whether it needs to look at the, at the policy again in light of the judgment. So we haven't as yet had any indications to any changes that are going to be made to the PPTS? No, the judgment's very recent, so I'm not aware of that if there have been. But um, no. uh, yeah, I'm sure if there are, it will be, it'll be made clear quite soon. Yes, thanks very much. Alex. Thanks. Harley, can I turn to you, please? Um, and it just concerns, again, looking at the issue from a practical perspective, how you see either inspectors or policy decision makers um, dealing with the question of oversupply. Um, can you help on, on that issue, please? Yeah, I think it, it really depends on the circumstances of the case, um, because in Tewkesbury, although you had quite a, you had a historic oversupply, the inspector was um, actually very concerned about the future of that trajectory and whether that um, good record of supply would continue. Um, so you, Mr Justice Dove is, is, is reluctant, really, in his judgment to, to say how decision makers should deal with oversupply. And he says that it's, in each case, it's, it's a matter for them. Um, so that you could, for example, say that if you've oversupplied by a thousand houses, that oversupply, A, should be um, entirely credited within the next five years, or B, it should be credited across the remaining plan period. And Dove doesn't say how you should do that. But it seems to be in the, in the, in the um, appeal decisions that I cited, the actual facts on the ground were really um, decisive because if you've got a, a local authority that's got oversupply, that in fact their, their future trajectory isn't looking good, it's probable that the inspector could be convinced um, that oversupply shouldn't be taken into account because the whole requirement of, of the five-year housing land supply is to deliver housing. And if, if that's not going to be delivered, despite uh, previous oversupply, um, it shouldn't be credited. So it's not a very satisfactory answer, I'm afraid, um, but I think it's up for it's basically up for grabs uh, in every case where there is oversupply. I think it's going to be a, a something that um, changes as time goes on and mm. as further decisions come out of the inspectorate, perhaps uh, we'll get mm. some greater clarity as to a standardised approach, it's often happens in mm. fact, many different cases. Do you think that's right? Yeah, I think the, the, I would, if anyone um, is... is is working on, on this at the moment. I've got an, an oversupply case at the moment. I would I would refer them to the two decisions on my slides because there are some very helpful analysis by the two inspectors in those decisions, um, and they cite other inspectors. So there's some that, that's that's a very good starting point, I think, um, as to how the inspectorate is starting um, to address this. Good, thank you. Thanks very much, Holly. Well, thank you um, to uh, all four of you for the um, very interesting presentations that you've given, and they're informative and engaging. Um, we come to the end of our uh, session. I want to thank everybody else uh, who attended the webinar for their attendance um, and for the questions that they've asked. We've hoped to answer as many questions as we can. I can see there are other questions coming in. Um, I'm sure that if that's going to be possible for a, one or more of our panellists to answer, uh, they'll do so. So um, you'll get a recording of the uh, event. Uh, once again, thank you very much for attending, everyone, uh, and goodbye.